I'm wondering if we can start out where you were working at, was it the YWCA? YMCA. YMCA, okay. Yeah. And um, it sounds like you were doing fantastic and they wanted to promote you again. And if we could start out on that story because I find it so fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is a lot earlier and obviously in my career. Um, I graduated from film school, went to USC, um, kind of thought like everybody does when they graduate from film school that you're going to graduate with like a three picture deal. And that isn't really how it works. And so um, <clears throat> while I was in college, I had worked as a lifeguard and kind of an aerobics instructor and at a YMCA. And um, they kept promoting me. And every time someone would quit, they would say, well, do you want to learn how to do this job? And I always said yes. And so eventually I worked my way up to program director and ultimately executive uh, senior, uh, senior program director, which is right under the executive director. So the executive director heads up a branch and then there's a senior program director or two and then all the program directors under that person. So I had been working there and um, it was, I mean, it was fine. It wasn't what my degree was in. And so at one point, finally, I thought, well, <clears throat> you know, I had a lot of school debt um, going to USC. Obviously, I was like, I think I, I think I was about sixty, seventy thousand dollars in debt at that point. And my executive director came to me and said, um, you know, we'd really love to give you your own branch, um, but we need a five-year commitment from you to do that. And they were gonna pay me over $100,000 a year. And that would have been great going towards my debt. And so I said, well, let me let me think about that. So I went home that night and I really thought about, you know, what I wanted to do with my life. I had gone to film school. I really hadn't given it the chance that it deserved. And um, so I thought, well, I'm this much in debt anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the chance on being a screenwriter. And so I went back the next day and I thanked the executive director for the offer and um, said, you know, I, I can't accept it. And also I have to put my two week notice in um, because I need to take six months off and I'm gonna take out a loan to live on and I'm gonna live my life as a writer. And if it doesn't work, I can come back and I'll let go of that dream forever. But if it does work, I owe it to myself to give myself this chance to actually become a screenwriter. So I did exactly that. She wow. was not happy <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> um, that I was leaving, but, um, but I did put my notice in and um, I did take out a loan to live on. And during that time, I wrote two screenplays. I never sold either of them, but they both got me work. And um, they got me work and then those got me work. And it actually ended up being really the beginning of my career as a screenwriter. Wow, so many questions. <laughs> I know, right? Because and there's so many little interesting parts to that and scary parts too. Yeah. And I've known a few people that have been stuck with the debt doing something similar. Yeah. So I know that is a risk. It, it's a huge risk and I would never encourage anyone to emulate that in any way. For me, um, for me it worked. And I think because I'd already spent the four years in school, you know, kind of gearing myself up towards this career. And I think also, I needed that time. It was such a distraction to be working full time. I needed that time every day to truly be writing. And I spent every moment of that six months furthering my career, going to networking events, um, watching a different movie every day and breaking it down and doing an outline so I could understand the structure of it. Um, all of those types of things. And then and actually writing, spending the time writing so and reading. So um, for me, it worked. But I, you know, like I said, I've known people also um, who where it didn't work, and you know. But you have to really, if you're going to do something like that, you have to really make use of that time. You know, it can't be one of these things where you're going to try to figure out what you want to do creatively, because I think that you kind of just end up treading water in a way. Um, you've got to have a plan, and you've got to execute that plan. Fascinating. Um, I want to hear more about the six months, but just one quick question before, or two quick questions actually, yeah. and that is, did you already know, and forgive me if this is too personal, did you already secure this loan so you knew, or you knew that you could go and get it? I mean, oh, I know that's I, a very Trust personal. me, when you're 60 grand in debt, <laughs> let me just explain something to you. Uh, you get so many credit card offers that will, you know, you can pay 20000 here's an additional 20000 they all want, that you're like the best uh, customer ever, okay. right? I see. Because they know you carry debt. So, and, and I was making the minimum payments. 
So, but again, you're going further in debt by, by doing that, but yet you're, you're sort of like the, the golden child for the credit card company. So I had plenty of offers. I knew I could take out loans, additional loans and lines of credit on my credit cards. Ah, okay. So it was just, it wasn't if it was just which one. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Gotcha. And then my other question was while you were working at the YMCA, were you also writing on the side? So you knew that this, I mean, aside from going to film school. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I thought I was going to, but I think at the level where you become a, a senior program director, I mean, you're working so many hours and you're also, I mean, I had, I had like, I think 45 people working under me at that time. And so when they don't show up, you have to cover. And so you come home and you're not in any place to really be creative. So I, for me, I found that I wasn't during that time. I had really just put all the writing on the back burner and, and that was it. Even on the weekends, I would get a few hours in, but it was, that's not enough to, to make a career out of writing. So during your two weeks notice, I assume, mm -hmm. were you planning out like what your day was going to be like once the six months? Yeah. Happened? Yeah, it was. I had, um, I definitely had a plan and I knew, um, I knew that I wanted to spend the time writing and I just needed to figure out, um, what I was most efficient at, I think. And for me at that time, it was structure. Like I was always a really good character writer. And, um, so I knew I needed to learn structure better. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the things I knew I was going to have to work on. And so I bought the books and I did all that kind of stuff. And so I was, I was definitely prepared during that time so that when I could just, I could jump off and, and begin my six month education since, you know, six months actually ticks by pretty quickly. Yeah. And I'm wondering what was day one like? like oh your my life? God. If I could even think about <laughs> what that was like, um, <clears throat> I think, um, I think there was a huge sense of relief in it in that um, I was finally doing what I probably should have been doing for the last couple of years. So, you know, and, and I felt like I was gonna enjoy every moment of this. It may, I may only get, you know, six months of doing it. So um, that's, that's basically what I did is I just really enjoyed that this is gonna be the life of a writer. No, and probably that was sort of bittersweet too, because you thought maybe this was the only six months that you would ever, this would happen. Exactly. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. I, but I wasn't thinking that far ahead because I had a lot of confidence that if I did this, I could make it happen. So, um, I don't think I ever got caught up in that, oh, this might be the only time I get to do this. I think I was looking at it more like this is the beginning and I just have to figure out how to make this last and how to make the money back so that I could continue to do it. How did you know you could trust yourself? Because I think that's probably the number one thing is knowing you could trust your time and allocating the right resources. I think I've just always been someone who trusts myself in that. Um, yeah, I guess when it comes to that kind of a thing, you know, the only person that's going to make something happen is you. And I feel like just in general, my perspective is you have a lot of control over that. So I think for me, you know, I'd gotten into USC. It was a very competitive program. Graduated at the top of my class. I had won awards while I was there. I knew I was a good writer. I wasn't sure why I wasn't working. Like, I wasn't sure why I wasn't selling scripts. And so um, for me, a lot of it was like, well, it's not because you're not a good writer. It must be because you're distracted. You're not focused. So you just got to get that back. And once you do, you'll be able to move forward. And I, I think that's where my head was at the time. Yeah, I think so many people, it's that big dilemma of like, do I want to be comfortable and have a job and have one that has a good title and that friends and family are going to respect and I respect myself for having? Or do I want to, unfortunately, have life be a little bit uncomfortable? And that's, so were you prepared to be uncomfortable, whether it's cutting back on spending? Oh, or yeah. You I, and I mean, I think I still am to this day. I think that I think I would tell any writer that, that you have to be willing to sell your nice car, to sell your house and move back into an apartment. You have to love this job more than you love anything you own because it can go away like that. And just because you, you have some success doesn't mean you should ever get comfortable with it because things change. The industry is always changing. You're changing. You're getting older. Um, you know, there's new people coming in. There's so much in flux all the time that you really have to be in a place where you're willing to give that up. You have to love it enough. And if you don't love it enough and you really just want money, there are a lot easier ways to go make money than to be a screenwriter. 
So that would be my advice. During the six months, were you doing this seven days a week? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But it didn't feel like it didn't feel like work because I felt like I was finally getting to do what I really wanted to do. And I woke up every morning loving to write, couldn't wait to get back on the script and, and, and keep working on it. So it never felt like work to me. So lastly, if someone said, Christine, I know this is a huge risk and I know that I shouldn't take a line of credit out and I shouldn't, or, or even something, use up my savings, whatever it is, but I want to risk it and I'm willing to face the consequences. What would you say are some hard, fast do's and don'ts? Um, that's a great question. Um, I would say go into it with a plan. Um, you can't waste a single minute of that time. So go into it with a plan um, and tell other people your plan. If this is what you want to do, um, first of all, if you tell many people that you're going to spend your life savings to make a film or to pretend to be a screenwriter for six months, most people are going to tell you not to do it. Uh, most people told me not to do it. They, they thought it was crazy. Um, but I think you have to ask yourself those really hard questions. Like how much do you trust yourself? How much do you want this? And how much are you willing to lose and give up? You can always go back and get a job at a Y or State Farm or wherever you're working. Um, and, and in general, successful people tend to be successful no matter what they do, right? So, um, you know, if you were being promoted at that job, you can get another job. You'll probably be promoted at that job as well. So um, I would say, but go into it with a plan and know what you want to get out of it and have a way to measure that success. Because a lot of times I think writers, we aren't very good at measuring what's working for us and what isn't. We just sort of kind of willy-nilly go, oh, today I feel like writing this and now the script's done and maybe I'll turn it in and maybe I won't and maybe I'm going to rewrite it. And um, You have to really kind of look at your life like a business. And I think if you can manage it that way, you have a better, um, you're better prepared for seeing what's working and then and continuing on that route or seeing what's not working and abandoning that, that strategy. So you have to look at it more like a business. That's, that's a big thing too. So I'm just trying to figure out the timeline. Okay, so the six months ends and then you don't go back to the why, right. sounds like. Right. Well, I wasn't like suddenly rolling in money and getting offers either. Um, <laughs> I did end up getting, at that time, um, a lot of interest, and I was working writing. So what I actually ended up doing was I was hired to rewrite other people's scripts. So I didn't sell my own, um, but a production company hired me to do some rewrites for a couple of Lifetime movies. Actually, yeah, a couple of Lifetime movies. They were doing Lifetime at the time. And so um, I did that, but it wasn't enough to completely pay the bills. And I didn't know if there was going to be more, because every time a project ends, you don't know when the next one's coming. So, um, so during that time, I decided I needed to maintain what I was doing during the day. I needed to be able to take these meetings with production companies. And part of working at the Y prevented me from doing that because of my responsibility there. So I basically needed a job that had less responsibility. So during that time, I worked for a temp company that, um, that catered to the entertainment industry. And so I could pick which days I wanted to work. And I was also uh, bartending at night. And so, you know, that was something that wouldn't interfere. Um, yeah, and then um, I was wait waiting tables also. So kind of doing what a lot of people who come to LA and do, who wanna be in the entertainment field do, um, because it was really hard to have the, the job where you could make a decent salary because with that comes the responsibility, which precluded me obviously from being able to go and have the time I needed to write when I was on these projects. And eventually I could just quit those jobs one at a time and um, got to the point where I was making a living just writing. Wow. So that, would you say it was like a few years out or? Yeah, I would say probably, I would say that probably was four or five years maybe before I could get rid of all the other jobs. But during those four or five years, I was rather consistently working now on screenplays and, and building my body of work. So you could almost sense that it's going to be around the corner. Yeah. It just doesn't. Just didn't you know, know when. Right. Yeah. Interesting. How are you dealing with being tired from working so many jobs? Because it sounds, I mean, it's exhausting just getting ready for one of those jobs, but then you still have to keep your mind intact to, to do rewrites. Or yeah, whatever. I think it's, um, 
First of all, it helps when you're in your 20s. <laughs> That's true. I don't know if I could yeah. do it. I don't think I did it in my 40s. Um, but yeah, so in your 20s, I mean, you just have a lot more energy. Sure, okay. Um, but also, <laughs> you know, again, the writing was what I looked forward to. So I would get up and I'd go to the job because you have to go to the job. But then I would come home and the writing is really something that energized me. And so I never really looked at it like I needed to be, uh, that I was just too tired to write. I just, I don't think I've ever really felt that. Because for me, it's the thing that I, I just want to do all the time. Like I'm always so much more comfortable with a pen in my hand and a piece of paper and just in case I have an idea or something. So for me, it, it never felt like that. I was just curious, were, did, were one of your parents super disciplined? Did you watch? Because you just have this amazing discipline. I think both of them were. You know, my parents, um, my dad was a very hard worker. And I think my sister and I both got our work ethic from him. Um, he was a door-to-door insurance salesman back when they had those. Oh, right, right. And, um, and he did very well, and, but he was always working. And my mom um, was the very much pro-education. She has a doctoral degree. And so I think we were just sort of this combination of, you know, he never went to college, but he worked really hard. And my mom was all about, you know, she has multiple degrees. And so we kind of were a mix of both of, seeing both of those people in our lives, so. And door to door, it sounds like you would have to be so self gen like you would have to be your own taskmaster. And and he very much was ah, that. He's very self motivated. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, that would you talk about that first knock on that door? Yeah. That would terrify but, me. You know, it, it would terrify me too. I mean, yeah. that's definitely not mm-hmm. me. That's not my personality. But for him, you know, he's the type of person who I mean, people would say, oh, he could sell ice to an Eskimo because he's just that type of charismatic person, and he loves getting to know people and talking to them and selling them and, and he loves selling things. So that for him was a great, um, a great occupation, but very self-motivated because you do have to get up every morning and you have to decide where you're going to go and who you're going to try to sell to. And he had a lot of control over that. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. You were doing rewrites for several years. When did you actually sell a first script? Oh gosh. You know, I don't think I sold a spec until years into my career. Most of my early work was doing rewrites and then talking to the producers and saying, you know, you're, you're basically paying other people the bulk of the money to do this original draft and then I'm fixing it. Why don't you just hire me to start? So they were, so then they said, yes, we'll do that. And so, um, but those were still work for hire projects. So they were coming to me with the concepts and the ideas or whatever. And then I was just writing them. So it took a long time before I actually sold a spec that I had just written on my own and taken to market. So it sounds like the the traditional way that you think of, oh, you're going to go pitch and they're going to like say yes and, and write you a check. You had already had inroads and you were already doing work, but you were fixing other people's work and you just kind of like created your own job. Yeah, it basically. Like, okay. it, you know, most people, when they think of, of screenwriting, they think of that. They think of the pitch and going into the room and pitching and then someone saying, yes, go write this for us, we love it, and then you sell it. Um, and that certainly exists. It didn't for me. Uh, that's just, there's a ton of work in rewriting other people's stuff. Uh, and most people just don't know, most writers don't know how to rewrite. Like they, they take it to the level that they can, either they don't wanna change it. There's a lot of writers who, they really fall in love with their stuff and they don't wanna make any changes. And ultimately that makes them get fired off a project. And then they bring on another writer who will make the changes. Um, or they just have taken it to, you know, as much as they're able to take it. And uh, they want to bring in a fresh sense. So, you know, producers will sometimes do that. So that for me was where most of my early work was from. But I think that's great too, because you know the style of the person that you're going to be writing for. So. Yeah. I think that's an excellent way. Do a lot of people get in that way or, or is that sort of an interesting way to kind of create your own job? I think it's, um, I don't know if a lot of people get in that way. I mean, I do know other writers, especially in uh, the TV world when you're doing features for television, a lot of writers get in that way. Um, just being able to write other people's rewrites, you know, um, that's, that's key. If you can do that, um, you're pretty much going to get hired again and again because there aren't a lot of people who know how to do that. And being able to li- really listen to what the producer wants. And the more you do that, obviously, the more you understand budgets and what they want. And sometimes when you get cryptic notes, you kind of can navigate through those notes a little bit better. Um, so yeah, that's, but that is one way in that a lot of people don't think of. 
And I'm sure the writer that does the rewrites is probably much easier to deal with because they're not as precious because in terms of that's not their work, it's not their baby well, that's, that's a, being criticized. It, yeah. That's very true. I think writers have to be very careful about being precious because even with my original stuff, I have to take a step back and make sure I'm not being that way because I don't want to suddenly become the writer that they want to fire and hire, <laughs> you know, someone else. Um, but it's, it's difficult, you know, I mean, especially the more time you invest in a project, I feel like the more precious it becomes to you. It, um, which is why also I think it's important to, you know, to finish projects. And some writers will work on something for three or four years, like one, one script. Right. And, um, just you got to end it and you got to move on to the next thing because every time you move on to that next one you become a better writer so get those first seven under your belt and click them off and then you know keep moving and you can always you can always revisit them but you've got to keep going through it so even though the way you sold your first script was through the fact that you were already doing rewrites and the people already knew your writing and, and loved what you did do you then go in cold and pitch and is that a way that you've sold scripts? I am um... I've never sold anything that way, ever. Oh. I've never, and I've done it. I mean, just like every writer, I've gone in the room and pitched and, um, yeah, but typically those projects don't pan out. At least they haven't for me. Um, most of the projects that I get are usually because you've met a director, you've met an actor, you've met a producer, you've talked about it for a while. Yeah, we want to work together. You come up with an idea. Is this the right time? Eventually everything aligns and, you know, they say, hey, we've got the money. You want to do this script? Let's, let's go for it now. And that's how it works. So we have a wonderful viewer named Marcin. And by the way, hi, Marcin. And thank you for all your comments. Um, how do I ask a connection, for example, a successful screenwriter, to help me break into the business? Literally, how do I phrase it and what do I ask them for exactly? Marcin, that is a great question. Um, first of all, people who are successful in the industry are, are very, very busy. And if I wish you could see my desk because I have literally probably 30 scripts on my desk stacked up. And they come from, the, first of all, there's the work stuff that you have to read because you're going to either rewrite it or um, they need you to read it for some reason or other consulting jobs. Um, and then I have my friends who I'm very close to who are in my writer's groups and um, I read their stuff and they read mine. And so we sort of have this symbiotic relationship. And then there are the people I don't know quite as well who send me scripts. To get on that list is very difficult. And what a lot of new writers kind of don't understand is that I don't have a lot of free time. And so, um, you know, if I'm gonna spend any time at all, you know, having a life, I can't say yes to everyone who asked me to read their script because literally I probably get a request a day to read someone's oh, script. Wow. So that's a very tough thing. So first of all, let me just say this. Don't get your feelings hurt if someone says no. They can't read it for you or they can't help you um, because they just can't. And it's just, I, I just want to make that really clear. It doesn't mean that they're awful people or that they don't care about you or they don't want you to be successful. And I think sometimes people take that wrong. Um, the best way to get people to read your script is to network. Go to, and there are so many ways you can do it. Join writers groups, number one, that's the biggest thing. Have other people at your level reading your script, giving you notes, and then as you get better, they get better. And then everyone sort of can, you sort of develop this network of people that you can go to um, so that you're not just cold calling, asking someone, hey, will you, will you read this? Um, uh, networking with people so that you sort of do a favor for them and now they owe you a favor. So an example that I sometimes give is go volunteer at a film festival. You know, it's, it costs you nothing. You get to go, you get to meet everybody. You get to meet all the filmmakers that are there. You get to meet the people who are running it. They owe you a favor. Get to know them. Volunteer to be on someone's set. Go PA for two weeks. Someone who comes and PAs for free for me for two weeks, I'm much more likely to say yes. They're going to get on that pile versus someone I don't know, right? So start building the network first before you want to just hand off a script because otherwise, even if they say yes, a lot of times it takes them months and months to read it and then you're just kind of waiting and you shouldn't be waiting. You should be moving on, I'll always be moving on to your next project. So that's my advice. 
Yeah, and in in a similar question uh, as Marson has, I knew someone who was upset that a friend of hers did not help her and was higher up on the sort of writing food chain and was very upset about that. And I, I don't know how I feel about that. I've never asked anybody like that, but um, it, it, it would be a tricky situation. And, and this person was offended that the other person didn't help them. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that, because then there's a relationship at stake. Yeah, I think um, I think you have to be careful about that because just because someone's I'm gonna say higher up on the food chain, although I really don't like that. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry, I mean, for lack of a better it's word. <laughs> um, they're just further along on their journey than you are, and the thing is, is that that doesn't necessarily mean they have the right contacts to help you either. And a lot of people don't really understand that. They think, oh, you must be so well connected. Or um, because I've sold a lot to like for Lifetime, they think, oh, well, you must know. I, if I give you this script, you can take it to Lifetime for me. Um, I do know what Lifetime is looking for because I work with them a lot. A lot of times that script isn't what they're looking for. So, you know, even if it was a great script, I know it's not what they're looking for. I can't pass that on for you. So there's a lot of pieces of information you just don't know. Um, it's very easy to get resentful I think in this because you work really hard every writer does and sometimes it takes a really long time for things to pan out and so you're looking for any means you can and anyone that will just give you that leg up um, you know and, um, and and I've been there and I get it um, but you just have to be very careful because I think that those things can weigh on you a lot and when you start getting too reliant on other people doing things for you like, oh, well, I, I tried to give it to her, but she wouldn't pass it on. And then, so that was a setback. And then I tried to get my friend to do this because he knows an agent, but he wouldn't look at it. And that was, I think that you're doing yourself a disservice. So if you're constantly looking for the next way for you to develop the relationship with the people you need to be meeting, instead of relying on other people, you're just going to be helping yourself down the road. And those relationships build over years. And at the end of that, now you're the person that people are coming to. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I think aside from writing all these scripts that you do and rewrites, but you also do like speaking engagements and you go to yeah, conferences I do. and stuff? I do. Um, I speak a lot at conferences, actually. Um, and I do a lot of workshops, which are a lot of fun. I love teaching. And so, um, and then uh, I also do consulting when people hire me to read their scripts. So... I do that too, which is also great because it's also another form of, of teaching. Um, when I do consulting, um, usually it's, they obviously give me a feature that I'm giving notes on, but it's really not about notes for that particular script. It's about teaching them how to become better writers. And so that's a lot of fun for me too. Oh. And so they can go to your website, which we'll have underneath yes. the video and yes. they can contact All my, you. The information is there. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's say I'm a hypothetical person attending one of these conferences and then I'm one of the people waiting in line to talk to you and, you know, just say, hey, really enjoy the information. I was wondering, dot, 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 and that is, um, how can I become a working writer um, so I don't have to work a part-time job? I just want to go right into it. I think that everybody's journey is so different in this business. You know, if you want to become a doctor, you go to med school, you do your residency, and you become a doctor, and you know, you go work at a hospital. Um, that's not the way it works in the film industry. The key to success in the film industry is being open to opportunities and being able to see them when they come. Everybody has sort of this type A personality plan, right, where we go, okay, so I want this by this date, and then I'm going to try to do this, and, and we think of that as being ambitious right? That we have a plan, we're working towards something and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But if you get too obsessed with that, so much so that you don't see opportunities that come to you that may not fall in that plan, um, you can miss out on a lot of opportunities. And so, um, like I tell this story, um, I've told it before. Um, when I was in film school, a friend of mine um, did zombie movies and there was only five girls in my class and so I was always a zombie in one of his movies because he had no one else to choose from. And um, <clears throat> so years later, fast forward, we were graduated and he's a real producer and he calls me up and he's like, hey Christine, I'm doing a real zombie movie. Do you want to come down and be a zombie just for old time's sake? And I was like, sure, I'll come down for one day. And so I go down and I'm sitting there and I'm in full zombie makeup, like my hair is teased out, I'm green. And I'm sitting there with the background and if you've ever been on a film set, you know that, you know, background is pretty boring. You're sitting around most of the time. 
and um, but it's fun and it's a great day off. And um, as I'm sitting there, I meet this guy, also a zombie, who had just arrived from from Boston, and he had gotten a part on an HBO series called um, Carnival. This is actually several years ago, and we start talking, and he. Um, tells me that he has the rights to this off-Broadway play and he's looking for someone to adapt it. So at the end of the day, uh, he was a cool guy, really nice. I tell him, well, you know, if you need someone to adapt that into a screenplay for you, let me know. And then the very next day, the director calls me and he's like, I hear you're adapting our off-Broadway play into a screen. I was like, oh yeah, I did commit to that yesterday, um, but sure. So, well, let's meet and talk about it. So I go to meet with him and the director and um, this guy, and I realize when I get to the coffee shop we're gonna meet, I don't know what they look like because we were all dressed as zombies. And so I have no clue what they even look like. So we finally find each other and we end up doing a short. And that short um, premiered at the LA Latino Film Festival. And um, that was great, it was a great experience. I got to walk the red carpet, wonderful. I just did it to be nice, right? after just doing something to be nice for my friend from college. Um, a year later, I get a call from them, and they're like, you know what, Christine, we have some good news. Based on the short that we did, we've got financing to make the feature. Do you want to write the screenplay for $25,000? Wow. And uh, I mean, yeah, of course. No, I'm going to say no to 25 grand. <laughs> so especially when I was still in debt and all that. And this was during that, that period of five years where you know, I was just doing things to be on film sets and to network. And um, so, yeah, I did that. And again, that was an opportunity. Very, Still very proud of that film. That film became Hotel California, um, starring Tatiana Ali. Wow. Uh, had a great cast. It premiered the following year, so two years later, um, as a feature at the LA Latino Film Festival and um, did very well. So, again, you have to be open to opportunities. I never went into playing a zombie thinking, I'm gonna meet somebody who's going to have me write a short that we're gonna then turn into a feature. It, it doesn't work out that way. Just make yourself available and try to meet the right people and create situations where people owe you favors and they wanna work with you again. And when you can do that, then those opportunities will start to come. But you've gotta be able to recognize them when they happen. That's a great story. I feel like we're in this sort of like hacking bubble where everybody's got it wants to try to like make this quicker and make that quicker. And if I follow this person on social media, they might they might just put me in the project, which it it all happens. Mm -hmm. I know that it does. But I feel like we we're in this new era of everything's got to be quicker. And it sounds like you, although I'm sure you wanted certain things to go faster, you did things a little bit of a different way. But I and think it a lot out. of it was. I never went into all of that thinking that there was gonna be some payoff. I just loved being on film sets. I loved meeting other filmmakers. I love taking an off-Broadway play and adapting. I'd never done that before. And so um, for me, it was more about the love of doing those things rather than the payoff of somehow I can I can turn this into a moneymaker for me or somehow I can make this, turn this into a rung in my career. It was never ever like that. So, you know, they, um, Deepak Chopra says, you know, we make every decision based on love or fear, right? So all of those decisions, when I look back now, I know were based on the love of writing and the love of becoming a screenwriter not the fear of, am I wasting my time helping this person when I should be helping that person because they're gonna pay me quicker or they're gonna get me into their movie or they're gonna do this. Um, it was never like that for me. Right, I like that. So your intention was different. It wasn't about what were you gonna get. Right, and when you're not looking at what the pay, when you're not trying to see what the payoff is down the line, there's no, there's no disappointment in it when the payoff doesn't come because you're open to whatever that's gonna lead you to next. Right. And so you're, since you're quoting Deepak Chopra, I'm going to quote Louise Hay okay. since we're going there. And her thing that I love that she would say was, well, that's not a million dollars and people stomp on it and walk away from it. Because again, we're so, we're looking for, you know, I mean, it, I'm sure everybody would love to walk the red carpet, but it took these little steps. 
It took yeah. you going to the set. It took you talking to this guy, it, you know, it, forming a relationship, a business relationship. And then, then that happened. But people just see that result of, oh, she's on the right carpet. Exactly. I, I want to be there. Exactly. And they don't really know what it takes to get there. Um, and, and that's why, again, you have to be so careful about letting yourself become resentful. Like looking at other people and where they are and saying, well, why can't I get there? Why can't I get there? Like, that energy is not well spent. So focus on why are you writing? If your goal, and, and just honestly, be honest with yourself. If your goal is to make money, if your goal is to be famous, if your goal is to be recognizable and have a name, then this may not be the career for you because there, there are easier ways to get those things than by being a screenwriter. So I think if you just can say, I love writing, I want to see what today brings and enjoy every moment that you get to be on set, you get to be talking to directors, whatever you're doing, you know, these writing conferences are a great um, example. When you go to these writing conferences, people are there because they just love to write. They're just soaking it in and it's such a creative, inspiring environment. Spend your time doing those things, right? And take every piece of information that you can and, and learn and become better at what you do because the gratification that you get from becoming really good and writing something and saying, wow, this is pretty amazing, that, I mean, nothing compares to that. Not walking a red carpet, not seeing your name on television, nothing compares to that feeling. As a writer who's had so many screenplays produced, what have you learned about what studios are looking for? Um, you know, it's always changing, number one. Um, I don't work a lot with studios, I work a lot with networks, because most of what I do is for television. So, um, you know, it depends. I think they're looking for something that fits their model. When you go to sell a script, you're either selling to a producer or to a network or a studio. Those basically, that's it. So if you're working with a producer, they have budget constraints, they have location constraints. They typically have a business model where they make so many films a year at a certain budget level and then they know who they're gonna sell them to. It's a business. So you have to be very hyper aware of what those constraints are for them. And if you are, and you can write to those constraints, then you have a much better chance of selling your, your script. So understanding budgets, understanding production, those types of things are really important for screenwriters. And a lot of times that's the piece that they kind of leave out. I think most writers want to sit behind a computer and write and they don't really like to get out there and sell. They don't like to get out there and, and learn about production and stuff. But the more I learned about production, the more I became a, a producer, the better writer I also became because I understood what could be done at certain budget levels and I understood the tricks of shooting and, and how to make that, that all work. And then ultimately that's what kind of combined, which helped me become a director then also. So then know the studio or the network that you kind of want to write for? Absolutely. It, pay attention to what they put out. I have so many people tell me, oh, this is a great script for Hallmark, or this is a great script for Lifetime. And I read it and I'm like, this is not at all what Hallmark wants or what Lifetime wants. Or, um, so they're not paying attention you know, to what is being put out because they think that theirs is gonna fit that model. And it, it really doesn't. So you have to be very open-minded and, and self-critical before you decide that it's right for a network. Um, or a studio because it may not be. So I think you said earlier that most of the screenplays that you've sold have been through prior working relationships where you mm -hmm. knew the person. But when you did go and pitch, because it sounds like you, you have done that, uh -huh. when someone said no, what did that no mean to you? Um, it meant that the project wasn't right for them at that time. You know, I, I think you have to be you have to have a lot of confidence in your writing. First of all, to get to that level where you're able to pitch and they're willing to take a pitch from you, you're probably at a level where you know you're a pretty good writer. So you can't let that discourage you. Um, I mean, there are projects that we've pitched all over town that I still love and I still think are great projects and no one's bought them. And so it's just, it wasn't the right time for that. 
you can kind of obsess over that if you want, but the best thing to do is you just keep moving on, go to your next one, go to your next one. You can always come back and revisit something later. And a lot of times when you do revisit it, you start to see things about it that you didn't see before. Like, oh, I should have done this differently or knowing what I know now, I would do this because you're just more informed than you were before. So that's, to me, you just don't let it discourage you. That's the biggest take away from that. Did you always have that approach to it or was the first time, you know, sort of I think uh, I always difficult. had that approach. I, I think my attitude was always, and I think I've gotten softer as I've gotten older, but I think when I was younger, my attitude was always like, well, you know, if they don't like it, forget them, you know, <laughs> um, I'm moving on to the next person. Like if they don't get it, someone else will. So, um, but I think that is the right attitude to have. Um, and now I think, you know, I think that you can, you can internalize a lot of things as a writer. And I think writers tend to, um, we're always looking for like, oh, what did I do wrong? What could I do better? What, you know, why isn't this working for me? And I think that if you just stay true to what you believe in, eventually you're going to find that audience that's going to connect to that and that producer. And maybe it's just the timing. Maybe you just haven't met them yet. But again, it goes to why networking is so important. Expanding that group of people and networking and finding the right people that you want to work with that who creatively align with you is really, really important. Yeah. And the interesting thing is too, so many things change behind the scenes, whatever part of the industry that you're in, and you'll never know why. And you won't know, is it me? Is it, what, what was it? Did I say the wrong thing? Whatever. I tell actors this all the time. Um, from a director standpoint, when we do auditions and they, you know, they come into the room and they have five minutes to do their read. We know the moment they walk in, if it's a no. And wow. I tell actors all the time, like, don't obsess over what you should have said differently or how you should have delivered a line. It's not even about that. They either, we either connected you to that character or we didn't, period. And it's sort of the same with writing. You know, you're gonna find people who you just, at one point you're gonna be the one, this is the project. Someone loves this project, it's what they wanna do and they get it. But there's gonna be lots of people who don't, you know? That's why there's lots of stuff on television. That's why there's lots of movies playing at any given time. You know, it's, there's not one thing for everybody. So don't take no for an answer, just keep moving. I like that. So when you take on a TV writing project, how much information does the network give you ahead of time? It depends. So um, sometimes they'll come to me, well, it'll be either the network or a producer. So they can come from either. But um, sometimes it'll just be a title. Um, so for example, you know, we have, uh, for Lifetime we've done a, a franchise of different movies like we've done the at 17 series so we've got several titles that are have at 17 or the perfect or the online um so they'll come back to the producer usually and say we want to do another installment of the at 17 series and so uh how about this title and then we kind of get together and i come up with some ideas and run them past the producer and then we send them to the network and we see what they say and if they like them then we develop them so it can be that way um it can come from the other way. Um, when I did The Bride He Bought Online, uh, which I wrote and then directed for Lifetime, um, it was actually, I had written that as a horror movie and um, was gonna direct it and crowdfund and direct that as a low budget horror and then ended up pitching it because they had said, well, we're looking for some teenage, uh, we're looking for a thriller with teenagers. And so I thought, well, this one easily adapts. So all I have to do is sort of make it less horror-y and more thrillery, and I did that. And so, uh, you know, it can come that direction too. So that one came from me, um, and then they liked that. So it's just understanding those needs that they have and fulfilling it. And sometimes they come to you and sometimes you come to them, but it's always a very um, collaborative relationship. But by the time it gets made, it's gone through a lot of people's hands and ideas. And Fascinating. So let's suppose it's one of these where someone throws a title at you. Mm -hmm. So they say, you know what, let's meet in two weeks. What's your process going to be like for those two weeks to come up with? I mean, I'm not even sure. Are they even giving you sort of a, a synopsis of who this character is or no? They're just uh, sometimes you, sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Wow. Um, a lot of times they'll just say, you know, we want, it needs to be a female lead this age. We're looking for a thriller. It has to be contained. It has to be, a lot of times they'll tell the budget level. So, cause that makes a big difference in, you know, how many locations you have and that kind of thing. So then you just come up with some ideas that can fit 
and um, and then they either spark to those ideas or they don't. And a lot of times it's like, well, I like that idea, but we're doing something kind of similar. What if she did this instead? And and so that's how it comes about. So those conversations end up becoming the basis for whatever you're going to write. So then in those two weeks, I mean, are you, do you have sort of almost a composite of, of main characters in your head? Like I can see this happening to this person or the, I mean, I'm just wondering, that sounds fascinating. No, not really. I think I just kind of come up with those. Uh, I start thinking about it at the spur of the moment. So a lot of times I'll get inspiration. Like I'll watch a few movies and see what they've done lately. And, and then I'll think like, well, you know, this is sort of an interesting, what they did. This was unique. What if we did something like this? Or I have never seen a character who is agoraphobic. So let's give her that. And like, that'll kind of bring an interesting element to it. So those types of things. And I think also like, I just read a lot. Um, I'm always looking for interesting articles about crime and stuff like that, because truth is stranger than fiction a lot of times. So you can find out interesting things uh, that you don't even know exist, like diseases and psychoses and, um, the way people get away with something for so long. And so taking those elements and sort of just collecting those and having them always ready, I think are kind of helps a lot too. Interesting. So you're, you're always sort of just an avid reader of various things, yes. whether it's like a s police crime blotter in the, in whatever, in the local. I read all of that kind yeah. of stuff. Yes. And then you just kind of file it away. And I then, do. Interesting. Yeah. And when I find something really interesting, sometimes it'll be interesting enough that I'll say, you know, we should maybe do this story. Um, but usually by the time you've pitched it, 10 other people have pitched that. If it's, if it's already made headlines, 10 other people have already pitched that story to them. So it's just keeping that kind of stuff in mind so that when you're writing, you go, oh, this actually, this would be really interesting. And I haven't seen it before. Does the network require that you submit an outline before you start writing? Um, sometimes. It depends on the exec that you're working with and it depends on the producer. Sometimes the producer will um, require it. Um, sometimes it's just we go from one paragraph to one page. Sometimes we go from one paragraph to a script. It, whatever they want, whatever makes them feel comfortable in their process is what I deliver to them. What's the typical show that you're writing for the length of time? That it takes me to write it. Or the, uh, uh, let's see. Or the, uh, what would be the typical airtime of oh, the, the show? So for most television, it's 83 to 86 minutes for a feature. Oh, okay. So then what does that translate into in terms of pages? It depends on the producer in terms of pages. So, you know, the, the sort of the standard is one page equals one minute of screen time. Um, that's sort of a, a loose guide. Um, so I have a, a producer I work with who won't shoot anything under 116 pages because he likes to have a lot of footage to cut down to help with the pacing. I have other producers I work with who they don't want anything over a hundred pages. So it depends on their pro again, their production process. Um, so yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm really getting the sense that it's about flexibility. It is about flexibility. <laughs> yes. Being okay. flexible is, is definitely a help. Um, and, and giving them what, again, giving them what they want. So many, when I ask producers, why do you fire writers? I ask every producer I've worked with, Great. why do you fire writers? And they will always say, because they don't give me what I asked them to give me. So it's either notes they've given and then the writer comes back and they haven't done that with the notes because they thought they knew better or they just didn't know how, or they asked for a certain page count and it wasn't that page count. To me, those are the wrong reasons to get fired off of a project. Those are things you can control. So if you're just paying attention and asking them what they want and they want to tell you what they want. So I ask, you know, what do you want your page lengths to be here? What do you want your act lengths to be? Um, and then that's what I give them. Wow, that's interesting. So what's the time frame that you're usually given? Once, you've, once they've given you the title, you've met with them, you've come up with some ideas, what time frame are you working with? Um, it depends. Um, typically, I get four weeks for a first draft and then two weeks for every subsequent draft, um, which is, is pretty quick, actually. Um, it's not that difficult if you're only working on one project at a time, but a lot of times you're, you know, if you're a working writer, you're working on multiple projects because it takes so long before one of them suddenly comes back and says, okay, we're, we're greenlit. We can actually move forward. You don't know when that's going to happen. So, you know, you've got all these sort of irons in the fire and then eventually one will come back and sometimes two come back, which is great. But now you have to balance how you're going to, you know, 
deliver both of those scripts. So let's suppose, let's just have it be one, because I'm, I'm really curious how you spend your time and how you, how you organize it. So if you have four weeks to write a first draft for mm -hmm. one, what's your work schedule going to be like? So my process is probably a little different than most people. I, I write 15 pages a day. Wow. So um, basically I figure out when it's due and I back out 15 pages per day and I take into consideration if I've got something going on in the afternoon, like today is not a 15 page day because I'm, I'm with you guys. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> but I, and then I work until those 15 pages are done. So if I'm done at three o'clock because I had a great writing day and it went really smoothly, fantastic. If it takes me till nine o'clock, it takes me till nine o'clock and then that's when I end my day. It helps to, it helps me to do that because it, I keep on track. And I also don't get caught up in my own, oh my gosh, I'm loving this, I just wanna keep going because that can happen too. When you're really on a roll writing, you'll, I mean, I've had that happen where you just don't eat and you just keep working through the night and you're just so excited about what you're writing. That's fine, um, but you can't make a living living that way, right? You have, I have relationships and I have people and dinner to make and things like that. And so I stop when I, this is my way of doing it. I stop at 15 pages and that's it, and pick back up tomorrow and start again. Wow, were you always that precise with it? I mean, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's kind of, it feels very, I know that seems very technical, right, for something that's so creative. Um, but again, like I said before, you have to look at this like a business, right? So you have to plan and organize and figure out what's giving you the best results. And for me, this gave me the best results um, because I know at page 11, I only have a few more pages to do and I can be done. Um, and so, you know, and at the beginning of every day, I start out and I go, okay, that's enough, it's a big enough chunk that I'm not forcing myself to go back and reread. That's a deadly thing that writers do is they go back and they rewrite themselves over and over. So it forces you to keep moving through and then you do your rewrite at the end. So once, once those 110 pages or whatever are done, <clears throat> that's when you... That's when I go back. And I build in usually a couple days off because you need that time away from it. Um, to kind of forget about it a little bit. And then when I come back and I reread it, I give myself two or three days to do the rewrite and it's just basically cleaning everything up or changing act breaks or, you know, if I've come up with an idea in between that time to add, then I'll do that. That's great because, I mean, really, in a sense, you want to think that you're your own boss, but really the network is your boss. So you're working for them, but you've also got to monitor yourself. So yeah. that sounds like a great way to... Keep yourself on track so you're not doing two pages a day, right. but you're not burning yourself out. Right. And I think also you can get obsessed with, is the writing good? Is it not good? Do I like this? Do I not like it? When you have to get those 15 pages done, eventually you have to say, screw it, I've got to move on. And it forces you to move on, which I think is good for the process because nothing really good comes from sitting there obsessing over the same scene. So it is what it is. I moved on, I can come back to it. And giving yourself permission to do that, I think is very healthy. And I think it's actually good for the process and the product. So now let's suppose you have three projects going. Mm -hmm. Are you still doing 15 pages? It depends. So yeah, so 15 pages on something. I don't, you know, some writers will say I'm gonna do seven pages on this project in the morning and then seven pages. I don't do that. I say, okay, this is my, I'm doing 15 pages today on this and I'm taking three days off to work on the next project and then I come back to it. So um, that's kind of how I organize it. I have a hard time splitting it up and trying to work on different multiple projects in, in the same day, especially at 15 pages. I think if you were doing fewer maybe, but 15 is pretty ambitious. Yeah, that would sound difficult if the stories are so different or, you know, I mean, you just want to keep the character and all of that separate. And yeah. to, to have to split it up in one day because your mind is going to It's be... worse when they're actually similar. Oh. Like if they're both projects for the same network because, or they're both thrillers because then it, that's when it gets confusing. It's actually better when you're doing like a romantic comedy and then also working on a thriller because they're so different. You don't, you don't mix those characters up at all. It's that obsessing though. It truly is. I've seen so many writers who will sit there and they will go over the same thing over and over and it's just not productive at all. Right, so you really, okay, we, we can talk. I wanted to talk about okay. once the draft is, because that's, I think we've heard from a few writers that some of them do like three to five pages a day. So forgive me, because I'm not in that space writing scripts, but how are you able to do 15 a day? I mean, that's fantastic. I, I, think, I think a lot of, well, first of all, I think over time you just get better, right? So 
you know, it's that 10,000 hours. Once you put that in and you become the expert in whatever you're doing, you know, you can recognize when things aren't working, you recognize when they are working. Um, for me to do the 15 pages, you can't waste time at all on obsessing over if you like this scene or you like this line of dialogue. It's, it is, this is it, it's on the page, you move on. And then everything's about coming back and refining it later. But getting it out um, is a much more productive use of time than getting stuck in sort of that turmoil of not knowing if this is good or if you wanna go this direction or whatever. Have to make a decision and, and move forward. And when you do that, you tend to get a draft done faster, which gives you more time to go back and kind of remold that draft. Um, a lot of writers also turn in their first drafts. And I think it's really important to never show anyone the first draft, to always go back at least once and clean things up um, because it just it makes such a difference. Well, that was, yeah, I was curious. What happens after the four weeks? You haven't read it. Let's suppose you have 110 pages or so, um, give or take. I'm assuming then you're combing through it? Well, the 110 would be in three weeks so that I would give myself that last week oh. to take a couple of days off, right? So at 15 pages a day, what is that for a hundred page? I mean, you only really need 10 days, right? To write the initial draft. And then the rest of that is going back up and cleaning it up and moving your act breaks and, and tweaking dialogue and that kind of stuff. Oh, and so you, then you throw in the three days to let it breathe for a little yep. bit. So you give it some space and then you come back and yep. then bam, it's four weeks and then you have a meeting with someone. Yeah. Is that how it works? Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. So four weeks, you're showing it to this person. Um, and the, what is that process like? Um, so I send it in and it depends on, usually if it's a very first draft, the producer is going to read it first. They need to make sure that they're on board. And you obviously, when you go to the studio or the network then, you go as a team with the producer. So they are happy with the draft. So they usually give you a set of notes first. I implement those notes and then once they're happy then it goes to the network or the studio and we get their notes back so by the time they read it we already know that the producers approved it for budget and they like it and so you've kind of got that person in your corner to if there is something to fight for like if there's a I guess if they don't agree with I don't know whatever creative decision you've made the producer is already on board uh, and understanding why you did that and they're sort of on board with you. So it makes it a more productive meeting also to have that than just like a bunch of different people giving random different notes. That's, those are the worst and I've had that experience too but it's not, it's not the best way to do it. You know, it's better to kind of like go through the process correctly um, because then, then the drafts get better and better. So I'm wondering if we can even go in closer to a day of doing 15 pages. What time do you start? What is that? What is it like doing those 15 um, pages? I usually I get up early, so I usually get up around six and I start writing right away. And um, yeah, I mean, it's I take a break for lunch when I get hungry, and otherwise, I mean, I'm really just focused on getting those pages done, um, and that's it. I don't know. I don't know how to that's tell you any different. It's just, yeah, it's just a day, and you know, it's a lot of sitting in front of a computer. Right, and so you at, at 6 a.m., you're ready, like... I get more done in the first two hours of my day than probably the last five hours of my day. So, you know, whatever I'm doing, if I'm at the gym, it's a better workout in the morning. If I'm here working, it's, you know, I'm getting, I'm more productive, I'm getting more written. So I try to take advantage of those hours. I just happen to be a morning person. Right, you know, I get that, and, and I know we've talked to other people. I think you have less distractions then, too, whether it's just, you know just knowing you're up before a lot of other people or whatever And it's it controlling distractions. I mean, you can check email every 10 minutes if you want or check Facebook every 10 minutes if you want, but you have to, you have to force yourself not to do that because that really interrupts your ability to focus. And you're forcing yourself not to go back and reread, right? Because then you're going to be stuck on exactly. a scene. Interesting. Now, was that always the way for you? Did you go back and reread stuff and did you learn? I think I, I think I developed that over needing to be able to finish these projects more quickly and find a more efficient way to do it. Because I remember when I was in college and writing, I would do this thing where, you know, I would get obsessed with the writer's block. Oh, I can't get through this scene. This is holding me up. And, and it's, just, it's just a waste. And that's fine when you're writing as a hobby um, 
it's not really fine then either, but you know, at least you can manage it. When you're when you have deadlines and you know you're getting paid and people are expecting scripts and there's a crew waiting on you to do this so they can shoot it, um, yeah, you don't have that luxury anymore. So you just find the most efficient way. Are a lot of these productions taken to Canada to shoot the film? Quite a few are, um, but there's actually still quite a few that are shot in LA and um, and a lot of places. We've, you know. Um, Georgia, a lot of stuff is shot now in Georgia, New York even, New Mexico, so they're expanding a little bit. A lot of it has to do with the, the coming and going of tax credits and the availability of crews. So as these um, little pods sort of develop, you know, like for example, Vancouver was really hot, it's still very hot. Um, when Vancouver was sort of on the come up, there weren't very many crews. So everyone would take their films to Vancouver, but there's no one to work on them. So then, you know, so then they, now they have film schools and they're developing that more. So now more films. Get in. And so that's always in flux and everyone's trying to do that. Do you ever go on set? I do, yes. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what's it like to be on set? What, what, first of all, uh, what, how long is the production usually? Um, it depends. So a lot of these TV movies shoot for about 12 to 14 days. So the time on set is actually very short. A lot of time, I mean, some of them in Canada, we were shooting six day weeks. Um, usually they're five day weeks. Um, yeah. So you're not there very long. You're, when I go to on set, I'm usually there for a week for prep and then the two weeks. And then if I'm not directing, I'm just writing. There's no reason to be there after it wraps. If I'm directing, then obviously I'm there for a little bit or producing I'm there after it wraps, but otherwise I come home. So as a writer on set, what are you sort of just, and forgive me, just but like seen but not heard, and then if they have something they need worked on, then you're there, or how is that? I've actually been <clears throat> really lucky because the producers who've asked me to come on set, um, they want me to be there working. So I'm meeting with the actors, the actors are going over their lines, a lot of times they'll have things they want to change or whatever, so I'm doing that. Um, as they're going on the tech scouts, I go with them, and I'm rewriting based on what, how the director wants to shoot something. Um, so I'm rewriting the scene so that it, it matches what they've discussed they want, that kind of thing. So it, you're really part of the process, whereas it seems like, is that more film then, where the writer is sort of just like, great, we have your thing, we'll call you if we need you. Yeah, I mean, there's those also, you know, and there are certainly producers um, that, you know, you sell the script and you don't even know it's shooting, right? And then it suddenly comes out and you're like, oh, my movie came out and no one told me. <laughs> um, so there's, there's obviously that too. Um, and that's typically how it is. I've just been with producers who they like having the writer on set to make those changes quickly. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's both ways and neither way is right or wrong. You know, they always kind of talk about how the writer isn't really, no one cares about the writer and it's like the goodbye and you don't even get invited to like the premiere or anything. But, um, but you are sort of out of the process at that point, you know, you're so much a part of the beginning of the process and then you really hand it off and, and they take over and you should be moving on to your next thing. I haven't watched television in a few years just because we've been busy doing film courage and you know we watch a lot of netflix and things like that but i used to watch a lot of lifetime movies okay. and i'm just wondering has the character type evolved absolutely and, okay curious yeah because what the when i was watching it it was probably early 2000s maybe mid 2000s and so it was more i'm thinking of like connie selica as like you know the mom that's fighting for her kids or something which is great but i'm just wondering how has it become a little edgier I think it has. It's, you know, it's interesting because like anything, television is always reacting to what's going on in society, right? So, um, and, and they're always sort of bound by ratings because that's the game, right? If you have a network, it's all about getting the highest ratings. So, um, so networks are always evolving. And, um, you know, when I, when I remember Lifetime when I was a kid and my mom used to watch it, it was like a lot of like women getting beat up and then like fighting back finally, you know? And so we've kind of gone through all of that and now it's, it's very much about female protagonists, but it's also about evil women and, um, and it's, there's family components to it, but there's also a lot about women who are in their career. So it's, it's really kind of expanded to, um, to I guess reflect women in society and what they want to see. 
So, um, yeah, it's, it, it, and it changes all the time. We get new mandates all the time, like, oh, okay, well, we're not doing those types of movies anymore. We want to focus more on these types of movies. And so, you know, and then they try it out, and either they work or they don't. And um, so, again, it's just always evolving. Right. And the theme of the secret in terms, and I'm not talking about the book, The Secret, but like that, that there are like uh, hidden things that are uncovered. It sounds like that's a huge part. It is. And for, especially for a lifetime, like they really like the everyday woman. So a lot of times it's, you know, a story about a woman who witnessed a crime, you know, something that could happen to you that you wouldn't expect. And now suddenly you're thrown into this situation and you're having to deal with just the tools that you have as, a, as an everyday person uh, to try to get out of this extraordinary situation. And then the whole online component, which when I was watching it was just kind of coming into the sort of zeitgeist. And a lot of that, I mean, so much of it now is reflective of all the social media stuff and cybercrime and and everything that goes on online, online dating. And um, so it's, it's constantly holding up a mirror to what we're doing. And it's creating a lot of fears. I mean, I have to, it's kind of funny in the sense that, you know, if you just watched some of these networks, you would think like online dating is the most unsafe thing on the planet to do, right? Because everybody's so crazy. But, um, you know, that's what makes them fun, too. Right, right. Because it's always sort of like the perfect guy or the perfect girl or whatever. And I think those are some of the, t yeah. you know, and you don't expect that. But then there's something a little bit off. But we, we get off on that. Like, it's, it's kind of interesting, you know. So it's exactly. like a heightened version of what we kind of see anyway. Exactly, and there's an online component to it. You know, whenever a movie premieres, there's a whole, like we watch the Twitter feeds. You know, people watching and tweeting at the same time with people they don't even know, you know, watching the same movie and e either making fun of it or, you know, oh my God, I can't believe she actually did that or, <laughs> oh, I knew it was him, you know, that kind of stuff. And so that they've really embraced that too because that's the, the direction we've all moved. Fascinating. So if you're doing sort of instead of like watching a football game and people are tweeting about it or a political debate, they're watching a Lifetime movie. And so mm -hmm. you're looking at that information to seeing like why people reacted a certain way. I find it fascinating yeah. as the writer to see where people are surprised and if we were able to misdirect and if it worked and that kind of thing. So I like watching that. I mean, the, the networks watch it for other reasons because they... Um, they have a social media platform and you know obviously it helps their ratings and stuff so but for me um i just like to see what people are guessing and what they're not guessing and if if we've you know duped them into believing this person's the bad guy when it's really that guy and for me that's fun so i know we're talking about writing being very practical and business-like but it sounds like you really do have to be your own sort of you know middle manager or, or boss the stress and sort of unromantic notion of deadlines. How is unromantic that? Unromantic notion. I love that <laughs> a phrase. Um, you know, deadlines are the things that may that separate someone who writes for a hobby um, from someone who writes for a living, and those are two very different things. So um, there is a stress, obviously, to deadlines, but there's also a relief to deadlines in that once you're done with this project, it's done. Once it shoots, you're, you're off of it. Otherwise, you know, when it's your hobby, it's your sort of this, this project that you could work on forever. Sometimes people do work on them forever. So, you know, knowing that you're going to get to the finish line and then move on to the next thing helps keep you looking forward. And I actually really enjoy that. You know, I, one of the things I didn't like about the YMCA was dealing with the same issues over and over, the same personnel issues, you know, the same two people that you're counseling three months ago are back in your office and we're talking about this again. The same budgets every quarter, you're putting them together again. It got really boring. I, For me, I love going full force into one project and then now I'm done, I can forget about it and I'm full force into the next thing. So that's the beauty of deadlines. Right, so you're not, because I know, I think you'd mentioned about like, you didn't totally want a day job and I, I get that because it is a lot of that same <laughs> whatever the dynamic is. But then there's new problems with being on your own because there's like this free fall sort of that could happen or if you keep yourself on track, which it sounds like you are excellent at. Um, yeah, I try to be. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It sounds like it. I mean, that's, that's, that's a skill in itself though. Yeah, I think, that's think? The, that is a part you really have to develop and you have to, again, I always tell writers this, you've got to view this you know, because everyone sees writing as their dream job. 
right? And they have this fantasy that they get up in the morning and they're still in their pajamas and they're petting their cats and they're writing for two hours and it's this wonderful, you know, existence. And it can be whatever you want it to be, right? You're obviously in control of it, but you have to approach it like a business. You're, you're doing it not just because you love it anymore, but also to make money. There's that whole other component. And if you can balance them right, you can have both. You can still love it and you can still make money. But the money part is a big part of it, you know, because we all have bills to pay. So um, if that's not for you, then keep it a hobby, you know, and enjoy the process of writing two pages a day if that's what you like to do. Um, that luxury goes as soon as it becomes a profession. What did you do to get better as a writer from 10 years ago to now? What do you think it's been, whether it's just the 10,000 hours we talked about? It's a lot of it is the 10,000. I mean, I'm a big believer in that, that once you put in your 10,000 hours, you're at a place where you just have the confidence and you know what you're doing. And so the obstacles that you encounter, you just know how to tackle them. Um, and so that's very different than I think than I was 10 years ago before I had done that. Um, but I think also just being able to, to recognize your deficiencies. And for me, you know, when I read a great script and I go, oh my gosh, you know, this is a great script. It, I get really excited about it. What are they doing that I'm not doing? Like, what can I learn from what this writer did? Um, and so I think just constantly learning, you know, and constantly reading and constantly researching and having that in the back of your mind all the time that you want to get better, um, you'll just gravitate towards things that make you better. Um, instead of finding that comfortable place where, you know, you know, you're good at writing this, so I'm just going to write this over and over. I think forcing yourself to stretch and because once you do that, again, it's, it's a great feeling, um, you know, when you've written something good and you've done something you haven't done before, you, then you have something that you feel really proud of. I'm wondering what scripts those are. If you, do, do you have one off the top of your head that you looked at and was like, wow, I wish I'd written that or there, I want to do something like it that? It happens all the time. Like I can't think of like a specific one that's just come out, but um, I was just speaking on a panel and it was, uh, we were reading the first five pages of a bunch of people's scripts and then we were critiquing them and we didn't know the whole panel was and we didn't know whose was whose. And there was one that I thought was great that I really gravitated to. And so the guy came up afterward and was like, would you like to read it? It was my script that you liked. Oh. And I read it and I just thought it was really fantastic. He's a great writer. And I was, I remember reading it and the, it was an action script and I don't typically write action. So i it was so crisp and it was just moving so quickly. And I was like, I just love how he's, he's structured this and how, you know, even on the page, the way it looks, um, just so conducive to what he was trying to convey in terms of the content um, that I, I was like, well, I've got to remember this. So I was, as I was reading that, I was absorbing all that, you know, because he may not be as far on his journey as I am, but he is certainly a better action writer than I am. And so um, I was learning a lot from how he, he structured his and, and the words he chose. Yeah. And that's where you were talking about earlier I'm not sure if what the word was bitterness, but that's where you get that chance to either take it from bitterness to, wow, what can I learn and how can I do something similar? Yeah, you can learn from everyone. And that's the thing. There's so many people who, I think people just want to feel validated so badly that they get to a place where they're like, I'm the expert and everyone should just be listening to what I have to say about this. And that's, it's kind of crazy because yeah, you may, have put your 10,000 hours and you may be very good at what you do, but you can learn something from everything that you read, even learning what not to do. But even in, in really bad scripts, you'll find these little moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, that was really well conveyed. Or, you know, um, so just being open to those things and learning from other people because people are constantly adding to this body of of work that exists in the world. And there's so much for you to be able to read out there. Just you know, be open to what other people are doing. I, but then again, you have to love reading. So many writers don't love reading. So, you know, read, 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 and see what other people are doing. A lot of people want to start writing without ever having read a script. And I just, I don't understand it. Are you also reading novels too, or nonfiction? When I have time, I don't have a lot of time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when I get the chance, you know, I, I love to read novels.
Yeah, it's, it's such a lost art. I miss it too. And it's really hard in today's world because so much amazing I content know. is on YouTube. So we can learn it even <clears throat> faster by watching a video. But I miss the act of reading and it's, it's a lost. Yeah. It is. And even, I mean, I even get caught up sometimes in reading nonfiction because I feel like, okay, at least I'm learning more than if I'm reading a novel. But you have to remember you are learning. You're learning you're, by getting caught up in it and seeing how that writer has taken you through this flow of their words, you know, you're learning a lot by just doing that too, that you can then bring to screenwriting as well. Do you believe in screenplay structure? I do. I believe in the three act structure. Um, I believe in learning the rules so that you can then break the rules, but um, there is an acceptable structure to storytelling and there's a reason it works. And I think if you can get re really good at that, um, so good that then you can manipulate it, um, that serves you. What was one of the first books on screenwriting that you read? Um, I think the Sid Field book, um, because it was required reading for at USC Film School, but, but it's still a fantastic book and I think I actually still have it in my library. Oh, nice, okay. Yeah. When you're writing dialogue, um, are your rules for it the same or it really depends because of the character or even the producer, you know what they want? It depends. Um, yeah, a lot of it is knowing what the producer wants. Um, but a lot of it also is just finding the character's voice. You know, one of the mistakes a lot of screenwriters make is that they, all the, all the characters sound exactly alike. You should be able to, you know, block out the character name and know who's talking. And... Um, <sighs> You know, you can learn a lot about how people speak just by sort of listening, like listening in coffee shops to how people talk and stuff. People rarely are very self-reflective. People rarely say exactly what they mean. Um, people rarely talk in complete sentences. And so, you know, the words we choose, when you think about when you go to say something, there's probably a hundred different ways you could think of to say it. Why are you choosing the particular way you, you choose? And when you start to think like that um, and why your character is choosing to say something that way and what they really don't want to reveal, like why, why will they go to this length but they won't go just a little bit more vulnerable? When you kind of understand that about your character, then I think writing the dialogue becomes easier. But you have to put that thought process into it first to know what they want to conceal and what they want to, to give. Um, I think, and then, and then you can start working with the subtext and all that kind of stuff that makes all of that flavor kind of come out. Would you say a lot of um, the productions or the networks that you're writing for are heavy on dialogue? Just because, I mean, the nature of women, we tend to talk more, especially with other women, like that's, we kind of get together and talk and yeah, it's heavy dialogue. I think, well, the genres tend to be heavier on dialogue. I think also, you know, when you're, when you are doing a very contained, like a low budget, um, that has a lot to do with it too, because a lot of times the people are sitting and talking, right? So you're in a room, you're in a house or whatever, and so they're sitting and talking. But I think making sure that that pacing is good, um, so it just doesn't feel like really, you know, people just explaining things. That's kind of the death of people's dialogue is when people over-explain and they don't know how to sort of weave in that that exposition kind of nicely. Um, then it really just kind of like hangs there. That's that's not good writing. So hopefully there's not much of that that you're watching on television when you're watching that. Well, just as you said, you know, sort of the, the tone of the culture has changed. Has the tone of conversation in how you yeah, write it changed? I, I think it has. I think that people are actually it's, it's less than it used to be because I think people want things to happen very quickly. You know, like the two minute video versus the seven minute video. Like, so they want to get through this and the pacing has to be much more quick than it used to be. Um, so scenes are shorter, and so you get to the point much more quickly. Um, I think that has changed over time. I'm hoping to get your thoughts on finishing this sentence, and that sentence is, even when you walk out of the best film school upon graduation, you are? Oh, <laughs> uh, you're just another person with a dream. Really, that's it. I think, you know, being 19, 20 years old, you don't, I didn't know what to do with the best film school education in the country, right? I was just a 19-year-old skipping class half the time, you know, um, not really realizing 
what I was being given until later. So, you know, but hindsight's twenty twenty. So, but you come out of film school, it's still, it's still about you. It's still about what you're going to make of that education. Um, because all the education in the world and understanding how to write a screenplay does nothing for you if you're not willing to sit down and put the work in. Interesting. How, how long after did you, did you have that realization? Um, I think that realization came when I took those, that six months. I think, um, because I really, until then, I don't think I was working hard. I just thought it was going to come to me, you know, and then I realized I've, I've gotten off track. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And that's when I, that's when I realized it. Right. When did you go back for your master's? I was, um, I was a lot older. I was in my thirties when I went back for my master's. And so it's in juvenile delinquency? And it's in criminal, uh, my master's degree is in criminal justice, and I focused on uh, juvenile delinquency and cybercrime. Wow, wow. Well, I was just curious what prompted that, because that's a fascinating area to study. I've always been interested in it. Um, and then I think because I was just writing so many crime dramas and, and crime thrillers, that I thought, at one point I thought, how can I be a better crime writer? Because that's really what I am. And I made a list of things, and on that list was get a master's degree. And so I did that. Um, also on that list was to go through one of the Citizens Academies for the police department, which I did that. Um, so I learned so much from all of those things on that list. And you apply that now to the stories? Yeah. And also, too, in, in terms of the, the victim and maybe their reaction or their falling prey to someone? Absolutely. I mean... In, uh, in my criminal justice program, we actually took a victimology class, which I didn't know that even existed, that there's a whole study of how victims are treated by the system, how they react, the proper way to deal with them, primary and secondary victims and all of these types of things. I didn't know anything about that. So that was a big eye-opener too, just learning that type of stuff. And then also being able to sort of condense that material and use it to help other writers who are, because it's very difficult to research, like I can't call a probation officer and say, hey, I've got a character who skips probation. Can you tell me how to do that? Like they're never going to tell you that because you might have a brother who's trying to do that. So, um, so that's very hard stuff to research. So by getting the degree gave me some legitimacy also because everyone in my class was in law enforcement. They know I'm an actual screenwriter. Now I can actually call them and say, I need your help with this. Um, so that was actually a big help, too, that was completely unintended. Interesting. Wow. So victimology, that's incredible. And so that plays a lot into a lot of s the stories in terms of people wanting to believe someone's good. I mean, because I think we all can see ourselves as victims mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And, and But I know that that's a big part of certain stories and that, that you you have good intentions and then you're duped kind of thing? Well, it's just, it's not just that there, there's also, and this is where, you know, we get into a lot of political correctness when we try to have these conversations and we shouldn't because we need to have honest conversations about them. But at what level do victims play a part in being victimized? You know, um, there are certain people who will never be victimized. And there are certain people who are victimized over and over and over. And, you know, and again, you know, we, we get so caught up in, in trying to just convey this idea that it's not the victim's fault, it's the perpetrator's fault when something happens. They were the ones that made the choice to commit the crime. The victim was the victim, um, which is important, but they're, but what is it about certain people and their mannerisms and their choices that make them fall victim when other people haven't? And so a lot of it is studying that, which I find incredibly interesting also. And so you've been able to use that in, it sounds like, a lot of the characters that, that you write. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I try to incorporate a lot of that kind of stuff just to give it the authenticity that I think it should have. And, um, and I try to bring up some of those questions, right, these ideas, at least let people think about them as, you know, even if we don't, we don't make a concise statement about them, that there's this idea that you could be semi-responsible for what's happening to you. Um, so I try to bring this up and then let people talk about those things later on. So I looked at your IMDb and is the first credit, uh, writing credit, The Perfect Nanny with Tracy Nelson and I think, yeah, Bruce Yeah, I think that is the first one, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so how, is that the one that you had from doing the rewrite and then the producer wanted to hire you? Um, 
No, I got fired off that project. Oh no! Yeah, okay. I that was with a producer who I was working as an assistant in development, and then left. He sold the company. I left. Uh, was working then as a reader for a little bit, and then he invited me to come back and do this rewrite, which I did, and I think I did two drafts, and then they hired another writer, oh. which is fine. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, at the time, I was sort of sad about it, but it was a great learning experience because I didn't know what I didn't know, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so now looking back to see where I've grown, where I'm now the last writer on because I, you know, um, that was it was good for me to go through that experience and i was very grateful that he gave me the opportunity even to to do that one because that ended up being my first credit okay so the one that you were fired off with maybe not giving away too much information but did you see what it was or was it something that was out of your control no it, i just wasn't a good enough writer to do what they needed me to do ah okay so i i did improve the script and a lot of what i put in there ended up in the final cut um, but I think I just didn't know structure well enough to be able to fix some of the issues that they had that they needed me to fix. And so I fixed the character stuff. And then I think they hired another writer to fix all the structural stuff that was wrong with it. And so at that time, did you see it as structure, as st like a structural defect or no? No, I, I couldn't recognize that at that okay. time. Interesting. You know? Interesting. Yeah. So then once you probably were excellent at structure, then you saw... Ah, uh, that's what it was. Yeah. And I think okay. just also just over time, understanding, getting to know more what, what they want when they tell you we need this or we want this, what that means and how to incorporate that into a screenplay. You know, like we want to add edge to this. It's not edgy enough. That's a very obscure, you know, idea. So hearing that when I was that early in my career, I don't think I understood how to implement edge. And now when someone says that, okay, now I understand the questions to ask so I, they can tell me what they really want and I understand what they mean by that. So it's just over time I've learned what that means. Interesting. So if it's, let's suppose it's a housewife that has everything perfect and, and nothing's wrong, how would you incorporate some edge into that? Because I'm, I'm picturing that as the Lifetime movie that I knew, which yeah. was still interesting, but what edge would we add to well, that character? Well, a lot of times they might have like a dark secret or a fetish or something in their past that they feel ashamed of that they've kept from their husband. Um, so something like that, that, that is sort of just kind of lurking in the background that seems to sort of resurface. And it doesn't even have to be part of the A story. It can be something that just complicates the A story, right? So, you know, she, like let's say your housewife, they're been trying to get pregnant, she's finally gotten pregnant and she, um, has this ex-boyfriend who is getting out of prison and still wants to be with her. And so now he's gonna come back and complicate her life. And that may not be the A story, but it's something that now she has to tell her husband who this person is and blah, 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 that kind of Right, thing. right, and there's the edge. And there's edge, right? So there's the <laughs> intrigue to that. So it's, it's adding to, it's just, it's, it's rounding out that story right? And making people real because everybody has things that they're not proud of or whatever. And so this is something that you can add those and we can go even further, you know, in the Lifetime movies or TV movies with that kind of stuff. So is the aim to show sort of perfection and then, as we said before, backing out and then seeing that it's not perfect? And I don't know if it's to show perfection. I think a lot of what intrigues people are the pretenses, right? I think so much of what we try to do, even with Facebook, is to show everybody in the world what this great life we have. What every great, you know, you don't take the picture of the crappy ramen noodles you made last night because you were so tired to cook. You take it when you're at a nice restaurant, right? Look at this beautiful, or this thing that you made and you spent hours on. We put out a life that we want other people to see because that's what we think they're forming their opinions of us. The irony is that most people care more about themselves than they care about anyone else anyway, so they're not even forming those opinions. But that's what we do. Our characters do the same thing. You know, our characters live lives based on what they think they should be living, right? And so that's why it's kind of fun when you can, you can flesh these characters out and give them these things in their past or things that they're doing or temptations or whatever, um, you know, that cause those little things of conflict.
Right. And they always have to have a great place to live in all the lifetime. I mean, I've never seen a woman in a lifetime movie live in a bad place. <laughs> they, they have beautiful great. houses. There's, a, there's <laughs> definitely an escapism element to that as well. This is sort of a standard question, but it always gets great answers. Best piece of advice and what was it? And worst pieces of advice and what was it? Oh. Leaving out names. <laughs> no, I want to name names. Um, the best piece of advice I got was from a professor in film school. And he said, um, do what you love and the money will come. And I know that, I mean, he, that's not his quote, but it was the first time I had heard it. And I think it's very important to remember to keep doing what you love and the money will come. Don't focus on the money because when you start focusing on the money, you make decisions that aren't necessarily the ones you'd make based on love. So um, that to me was the best piece of advice. The worst piece of advice, um, was probably you don't have to change anything it's your script and you know there is always this thing about how much should you change you know before you're selling out how much should you change that a producer wants you to change and how much should you fight for your own vision um, my feeling on that is you can fight on the next one sell the script right and get the credit and get the money and at some point as you kind of progress through your career, you get more and more power, and then you have to change less and less. So, but you gotta get there first. So early in your career, do what they need you to do, make them happy, you're the client. They're the client, I mean, you know, do what they want, and, and make the changes, you know. You can stick to, to your, your um, own creative vision on the next one. So with both pieces of advice, did you agree or disagree with them right away or did it take some time? It took time. And, you know, very early in my career, I did that. I pulled a script away. Um, it was actually my thesis script that I wrote in film school. Um, I had a producer interested in buying it. And um, after he gave me the notes, I was convinced he didn't get the project. He just doesn't understand it. And um, pulled the script away and I ended up never selling that script. And I don't know if it would have made any difference in how my career went or not, because you just, you don't know. But um, in retrospect, that was me being a prima donna and um, thinking that I knew more. And once that happened, that experience happened, I lost that attitude, which probably served me very well for the rest of my career. Um, so I kind of hope that most writers have that experience early on um, because that will help them. Right. And then with uh, the best piece, Oh, the, do, do what you love, the money will fall. I mean, I'm thinking of the book. There's a Virginia, Virginia Scientar or something. I think I have that book actually at home. And I read it too because I was in a place where I didn't know. But but did you, because I had trouble believing that concept. It's, it's hard to believe that concept, right? Well, I heard it so young that I actually did believe it initially. Because when you're in college, you're not jaded yet. You haven't actually <laughs> been in the real world. But, um, but you do lose it. You absolutely lose it because... You know, when the money starts to not come, you the first thing you do is question that, right? And you start to compromise. And um, but the reality is, even through all those difficult periods, and and they will happen, especially if you're a writer, especially if you're freelance and anything, um, stick to what you love because it will it will happen. It will happen, and you just have to to keep the faith. I know it's hard. It really is. But my life has proven it. I feel like, and I think if you stick with it long enough, almost everybody's life will prove that.